Okay. So, George, right. I'll give you no. a five. No, you can't. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right, you can. I'll give you a five minute from the end. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, traveling down from Vermont, so I'm probably one of the only out of state people here. And uh, don't blame the snow for me, but it certainly helps with the program for tomorrow. Uh, so Cyber Tracker, uh, it's an international organization, and in the beginning of this talk here, I'm going to kind of go over the origins of it. You see there's a few things on here. I'm particularly going to talk about the track and sign evaluation component of it. The, uh, the a uh, few confusing things about this to get people confused is well, what Cyber Tracker have to do with the tracking bit? Yes. Can, you can't hear this at all. Okay. Oh, there we go. Good. Okay. No, not good. George. You can also uh, uh, use the mic. There. All right. That's I'll use the mic. So, um, Cyber Tracker. A uh, few confusing things about the name Cyber Tracker. Uh, is one thing that gets people confused. And then also, well, what's the, the person with the arrow there? What does that all have to do? Well, that has to do with the origins of where CyberTracker, the organization, started. Uh, CyberTracker started in South Africa with this scientist here at the top left of the screen. His name is Louis Liebenberg. He was working with Kalahari Bushman trackers in the early 90s. And he saw that these trackers had incredible knowledge of their local landscape and environment, but they had no way to share that skill with the scientific community. So in the early 90s, Louis developed this cyber tracker software, and that was kind of the beginning of how this got started. He developed this icon-driven system that ran at the time on one of these Palm Pilots. The system still used today, it could actually be downloaded for free at that website there, CyberTracker. And it can be programmed, at the time he programmed it, with these different icons, which was very easy for these trackers to interpret and see when they were in the field. And this was connected to a GPS unit. And they would then go out into the field and, and document and collect data in a region. Uh, and Louis de gave this to scientific researchers in the Kalahari at that time. And the researchers were just blown away with the types of knowledge and information that was collected uh, with, their, with their track and sign skills. So Louis's original intention for doing this was to create jobs for trackers through this system, specifically the, the Kalahari trackers. He saw that the tracking skills within these communities were dying out. Remember, this is a generational skill that had been passed on for hundreds of years that these trackers had learned, um, but there was no way for them to utilize it anymore. So that was his premise for developing this system. Now we're going to kind of move away from this because today the talk really has nothing to do with the cyber tracker component, but that's kind of why our organization is called cyber tracker and why we have the uh, Kalahari Bushman on there with, with the bow. Um, so in 1995, Louis Liebenberg, the scientist who developed the CyberTracker software, wanted to find a way to certify and evaluate trackers so he can employ the best trackers within those communities. So he developed an evaluation certification program, and that's primarily what I'll be discussing today. Uh, in South Africa, besides this being useful for research, this Field Guides Association, which primarily looks at um, uh, standards for people who are working at ecotour ecotourism industries in Africa, all the people who work at those game lodges are going through this certification process, both in track and sign and trailing. And for people in South Africa working in that industry, it's very prestigious to get a high ranking on this evaluation because it often leads to better job opportunities at the, the game lodges for them. So primarily that's all happening in South Africa. Um, in America and in North America here, uh, Mark Elbrock met Louis Liebenberg. Uh, Mark Elbrock is a author of quite a few books on animal track and signs, some of the most recent ones. Sorry about the image there on the, the right that says mammal tracks and sign book that he created. Uh, developed. 
the bird tracks and sign book as well. He's also got a fantastic guide to animal skulls, Peterson Field Guides, Animal Behavior Guide. He up did, uh, upgraded the uh, old animal track and sign, Peterson Field Guide. Um, he's got quite extensive res res uh, resume related to track and sign. He met Louis Liebenberg in early 2000. Uh, and Louis invited him to come back to South Africa to learn this evaluation process to bring it back to North America. So the first evaluation in North America was in 2004. And since then, um, there are now five other evaluators, myself included, and over about 1,000 people have been evaluated in the US since then. Um, we've done about 200 evaluations at this point in the States. And usually, um, many people who come to them come back repeatedly. Uh, so that 1,000 number is new people who've been evaluated. But people repeat these uh, evaluations a number of times. So like I said, it's an international standard that is really expanding around the world. Uh, Spain, UK, Germany, Netherlands, a lot of these other countries are adopting this standard for evaluating trackers. Uh, for people who do research work in the field using track and sign, but there's also a large majority of people who just take this evaluation just to, um, as a workshop basically, to learn more about animal tracks and sign. So it's not all about professional development. Some people just want to come out to it because they like the way the, the learning experience is set up. So the evaluation process, uh, we like to say it's welcome to all people. There's a lot of different methodologies, methodologies or way to learn tracking. Um, our system just has people show up and we get right into it right away. We just basically ask questions about who made this track or who made this sign. So it's not really connected to any type of tracking school. We offer this program in two formats. Uh, one format is a two-day field test. So everything is in the field. This isn't going to be doing PowerPoint slides. Um, I'll go out like for tomorrow, find track and sign, and then we'll ask questions throughout the day. And that tomorrow will be this kind of one day format, which will be about 30 questions. Um, and that's usually limited to about 15, 15 participants on that. The two, two day format is about 50 to 80 questions of things that we actually find out there. So these are the types of things you could kind of expect to see on uh, an evaluation. Uh, tracks, this is a, in the middle here, we have a track pattern, a gait pattern. So basically a question could be, how do you think that animal is moving there? Um, we have scats here in the bottom left, uh, other types of sign, beaver lodges, uh, who opened this nut, who browsed this twig, just tons of questions like that. And we will ask bird tracks. This is a uh, spotted sandpiper uh, track here in the top left. So there's really a variety of types of species we'll ask. We'll ask questions on invertebrates. We'll even ask questions of um, human-created sign that looks similar to animal sign. So really anything goes in terms of the types of questions that you can see on the evaluation. We score the questions differently, so we have to ask a, a, a not all super challenging questions. We have to have easy, moderate, and uh, difficult questions in a kind of even mix. So a few things about the evaluation process that are a little bit different is one of the things is that we don't allow tape measures to be used on the evaluation. Uh, Louis set it up that he just wants people to visually observe the track and sign without relying on the tape measure. Uh, the other thing is while you're taking the evaluation, uh, people won't be using field guides. So that $50 book you just spent here for the bird tracks and sign, you have to pack that one away. Although between, um, but while you're waiting for questions, you're certainly allowed to uh, look at field guides. But while you're looking at a question, you can't use a field guide. And the other thing is while you're there, you have an unlimited amount of time to observe the track and sign so you can come up with your best hypothesis or guess about what you think that is. So you can spend a, a, a good amount of time looking at it and you can wander anywhere within the area to try and get additional clues. Um, it's a personal experience, so you're not, people who are taking this are not discussing the track and sign with the person next to them. You're just pretty much on your own thinking about 
what you think the track and sign might be. The last one here is uh, certainly the most important. It's an, at, towards the end when we discuss the questions as a group, it's an it's a open, honest discussion about what we've observed and I'm gonna talk about the things that I'm looking at in the track and sign and then everybody else has an opportunity to talk about what they were observing as well. And if I'm incorrect on something, then that's, that's all fine too. So it's uh, not everything I say goes. This is just a few shots of kind of that process. So the way it normally goes is we will ask maybe about five or 10 questions at a time. People will give me those answers and then we'll review those five or 10 questions as a group. And this portion of the, uh, the field examination I think is the most beneficial process to the whole thing. This is where people have a chance to ask questions. We talk about things. We show field guide pictures. Um, you can see here that everybody in these pictures is kind of huddled around the tracks. They're all eager to know who made that track. And something that's different about this format than your typical nature walk is that you have to make your answer first. You, 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 you give your answer first and then we go back and talk about it. So when we do actually discuss it, everybody's quite engaged and eager to know what that was. Um, and if they were correct, the nice thing about it is it starts to build confidence within these trackers and their observations that they're making. So while I'm out there, um, there's a few ways that I'm looking at questions. And this is going into how we're scoring the questions. And this is how, this is how all the questions uh, amongst evaluators, this is the formula that we're given to look at them. So we have, um, these are all Bobcat tracks um, in each of these three photos, a front and a hind, front and a hind, front and a hind, uh, the front being on the bottom. I got a laser on this, I think, right? Yes, so that's the front, front foot of the Bobcat track, that's a hind. Here's another front, another hind and the other front and another hind. You can see they're all on different substrates. And the first one is clearly um, a bobcat track in terms of scale, the number of toes that are present, how detailed the track is. Um, very clear track. And it can't really be confused with many other species based on the details you see there. So we call that an easy uh, one point question. So if someone answers this question correctly, they're gonna get one point added onto their score. If they answered the question incorrectly, they're gonna get three points off their score, all right? So if you get easy questions wrong on this, it could really hurt your score in the end. So the big thing is not to get the easy ones wrong. We've got a moderate question, so there's that bobcat there. You could see that it's not as sharp and clear as that one. So, but it's still clear enough that you could see that it's a bobcat, um, but it can be confused with other species at that point because it's not as clear. So that's a moderate difficulty question, uh, a two-point question. And then uh, the track at the bottom here in this loose sand, uh, that would be a difficult three-point question. So if you got that question correct, that's gonna give you three points on your score. If you get it incorrect, it's just gonna be one off your score. Okay, so um, it, it, just another thing on this, this, question, this track down here. This track would probably have associated tracks with it because by itself, this is an extremely incredibly difficult track just by itself. So normally there'd be a gate associated with it to help out. So that's how we score each of the questions. Um, and then at the end of 50 to 80 questions or 30 questions if it's the one day, people are awarded certificates um, if they qualify. So everybody who takes it doesn't walk away with a certificate. You really have to earn your certificate, um, meaning that you've got uh, 69 to 79% for the level one. And here's the rest of the percentages down here. You see that the bottom here, there's this track and, sp track and science specialist certificate. And that's the highest level that someone can achieve on these evaluations. And for that, there needs to be two evaluators present. But you also, 100% doesn't mean that you've gotten every single thing right, uh, almost every single thing right. We allow up to three questions to be answered incorrectly. 
And then you can get three bonus questions to eliminate some of those wrong answers. So we ask these difficult questions to help eliminate wrong answers. Um, just because to answer everything right is nearly impossible anyway. So there's some flexibility built into the, the system. Um, also, for some of you who might be interested, uh, if you fall under this category of looking for uh, certified wildlife biologist hours for the Wildlife Society's uh, degree program, uh, you can get six contact hours for the one day track and sign, and also 12 contact hours for the, the two day. So we have a list of qualified trackers. Uh, that are listed on this trackercertification.com site. Now that's the site for all of North America. So we update that, it has a calendar on there and it lists all the evaluations that are happening in North America. So if you're interested in learning more about this, definitely check out that website right there, Tracker Certification. Um, the other one down at the bottom there is the Cyber Tracker site. That's the one for South Africa. And on these sites, there's a list of all the qualified trackers and people who have taken this. So a few things. Um, the test is definitely achievable for people who want to go for the 100% rank. Uh, there started out when this first happened in North America, there was only maybe four or five people who got that high of a level, but since then, uh, we've got about 20 track and sign specialists now. And the system definitely works, even though we're asking just a small number of questions, 50 to 80 questions, which is just sampling a tiny bit of people's knowledge. It consistently has people dropping out at different skill levels of level one, two, or three, just on those short amount of questions for the one or two days. And like I said before, a lot of people who do this uh, like to do this for professional development to get a certificate and a patch. Those are the two things you're awarded at the end of the evaluation. Or they just like to come for the personal growth aspect. There's a whole community of people out there who just like going in the woods, asking questions about something, and trying to figure out what the mystery is. The nice thing about this type of program, if you're one of those people, and I'm sure we probably all have been out and observed something that we go back home scratching our head about. Throughout the two days, I'll be pointing out things that you might not have been aware of, and then we talk about it and discuss it, so it definitely increases one's knowledge of their local environment, of the animals that are moving around that area. So a lot of people just come just because they love going out in the field and tracking. And this is another neat one that people always kind of come up to me after I do one of these and they often say, well, this was really cool because it really made me think about how I go about answering these types of questions. What was the process that someone went through uh, internally to interpret the track and sign? And when I go through uh, answering a question, I kind of highlight the different things that I'm looking at in making an interpretation, and people often gather a lot of information about how they thought about it in comparison to me. So it's a really neat process for just evaluating the strengths and weaknesses that someone has in their observation skills. So um, I'm gonna kind of switch gears on you a little bit here and talk about uh, this Journal of Wildlife Management article that came out in 2009. And this is by uh, Jonah Evans, and the two evaluators on there, Jonah Evans, he's an evaluator in Texas, and Mark Elbrock, the guy who wrote the books and kind of was the initial evaluator here. And I guess it was right around when the evaluation started in about 2005, they did a study uh, that was looking at Texas parks and wildlife biologists in East Texas. And these otters had been surveyed in this area since 1977. And the researchers, Mark and his team here in Jonah, they wanted to uh, evaluate the level of false negatives and false positives associated with otter tracks op observations. I'll just explain that. But basically they want to know are these guys, uh, are these biologists uh, correctly interpreting the field signs of otters? So they did two evaluations there with these biologists, three months apart, there were 23 participants, the same people were in the second group as well. 
So just the false positive, false negative thing. So false negative basically means you're looking at a set of otter tracks, and that's the one on the right there, but you think it's a raccoon. So that's a false negative, and your false positives are going to be, well, you're looking at the raccoon tracks, but you think it's otter tracks. Okay, so that's the type of thing that they're, they're asking these people in the evaluation. Now, the evaluation just wasn't focused on the otter and raccoon. There was a lot of other species as well. So the biologists, this is the list of species that were called otter on, uh, throughout the two days. So we have um, raccoon and opossum, dog, house cat, um, rice rats. I, they must have some very large rats down there, um, turtle, even bullfrog uh, was one of the observations. Now, I was in Texas a few years after they did this study doing this, and I did see some huge bullfrog tracks down there. I mean, <laughs> they were enormous. Um, but, it, you know, to confuse it with an otter, it happens, you know. So the, the, the idea isn't to point out the, you know, the difficulties these people had, but you can see there's a range of observations. And remember, these people have been collecting data on otters since 1977. So that's a huge data set that is going to inform the state about otter populations. And they're making all sorts of management decisions based on this group's observations. So of the, that whole list there, the three species that were most confused are the raccoon, the opossum, and the swamp rabbit, which has got a much bigger foot than the cottontail here. So it looked very otter-like. So those three species were identified, uh, misidentified most frequently. So um, this is kind of the results um, of these experienced observers. Uh, they identified 26% of the otter-like species. Um, 26% 20, of those otter-like species, the raccoon, the opossum, were identified as otter. Okay, so 26% of the time. And then they also misidentified 37% of the actual otter questions. So that's they're actually looking at an otter track and they're calling it something else. So they were not too pleased with the results of the study in terms of their observation skills. So they definitely felt, and the, the article says, well, more rigorous training in track and sign identification is needed. So now Texas Parks and Wildlife, after this came out, has consistently been hosting these evaluations since that time, at least two or three times a year. Almost all their state biologists have gone through this certification program. Um, in fact, one of the women who did it didn't even pass the first time. She's gone on to get a track and sign specialist certificate, the highest level you can get. She was that intrigued by the system and has become a local community resource for the state biologists. In fact, Jonah Evans, the person who did this, he now works for Texas Parks and Wildlife as their conservation coordinator and does these evaluations on a regular basis for them. So I really sent big waves. That's probably the biggest, uh, the, the, the state example that CyberTracker has in the US that's adopted this methodology for training their biologists. So the study also goes on to say, uh, you know, it's difficult to, to rely or judge studies that rely on these uh, studies that use indirect signs. So studies that use track and sign material, just how reliable are they? You know, we just really don't know uh, unless the target species is unmistakable, the signs can't be confused with anything else, or the people who are conducting the study have been, uh, their skills have been measured and, and reported. So basically, the idea is uh, many wildlife studies that use these indirect signs would benefit from adopting the standardized methods to evaluate the skills of the field biologists and data collectors. So basically, they're saying the cyber tracker certification would benefit all of these types of projects to use track and sign. A nice thing that we saw with the data was the participants who attended both those evaluations showed an increase in their overall score from the 61% to 79%. So just as a training tool, having those people come back a second time 
people who didn't pass the first time almost got a level two certificate over a three month period of time. And that's just something I've seen over and over again in administering these. I'll have someone come to one of these for the first time. They might barely pass or not pass at all. They feel more comfortable with the system. They come back a few months later and then they do uh, substantially better, almost like overnight. So um, I'm gonna switch, switch gears again on you one more time because I thought it'd be fun just so you can kind of get a sense of what this mini evaluation is all about. So we're gonna do a quick little PowerPoint uh, mini evaluation here for everyone. So um, if you wanna play along with this, um, grab a pen and paper, uh, write down your, your, your answers to these and then we'll go through them at the end of this. We're gonna do 16 questions in a row which is more than we normally do at one shot. The tape measures provided in the pictures there, um, which we don't allow, but I will for this. And I'll just give you one other thing. This is pretend you're walking along uh, like a wetland environment. Unfortunately, this is gonna be more New England, like habitat, okay? So different from the island. Um, so you'll have to stretch outside of your region a bit for some of the species. Okay, everybody ready to go? And you know, you could play along and not discuss the pictures with your neighbors, but if you want to, it doesn't really matter. Mike, how much time do we have here? How much time do we have? Got uh, 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so here's, the, here's your number one question. Uh, first question. So who made this sign here? Okay, this is a big cottonwood tree um, with the bark removed on it on the side of the Connecticut River. I'll give you just a few seconds to look at this. Who made the sign? So write all these down, put number one and write down your answer and we'll go back through them. So who made these tracks here? There's two tracks here, one here and this one right up here. Uh, who made this scat? Uh, who made this sign on the side of the tree? This, big, this is a big cavity, a big hole in the side of the tree. Okay, this one might be a little more difficult to see, but who made these tracks? We've got a set of track here, 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 and over here. Okay, so that's the whole group of the tracks. Uh, it's another who made the track question. Track and another track here. Okay, so this is another who made the track and also which foot is this track? Is it a right, left, front hind, so it's either gonna be a right front, left hind, some combination, which, which, which quadrant of the body is it? All right. Okay, so this is a sign made on the tr this tree here. So it's gonna be who made this sign? It's right in the middle here. Now this is a person standing behind here with the rain jacket on. So their head is about this high. So this is a mark on the side of a tree about that high. It's not gonna be something found on Long Island. But it's pretty decent sized mark.
Okay, so this is going to be a tr uh, track pattern question. So how's this animal moving here? This uh, one right here. Gates are often a kind of confusing one for a lot of people if you haven't spent time studying these uh, types of tracking material before. Um, basically, animals walk or trot or gallop or lope. Those are kind of your main options. Uh, okay, this is another one not found on the island here. There's this yellow birch tree here with just a, a pile of scat pouring out of the base of this tree. This is just a mountain of scat coming out of the bottom of the tree. Scat is the animal feces, just a huge, huge amount of it. And those are um, probably like an inch long, each of those individual scats. Okay, so this is a, uh, who made the track? The track is right here. Okay, and these marks are associated with it. This is one foot. Okay, uh, who made the track and which foot made this track? Is it a front or hind foot? Uh, how did this mushroom get on this uh, side of the tree here? Uh, this one you're not going to find on the island either, but uh, it's a who made the scat and the quality of the image here is a little dark. This is a, a scraped area. The animal came through here and scraped this area with its back legs. Uh, this is a scat here. This is a bit more of a close-up. I never noticed that down here before, but um, that's the scat there. You might be able to find a similar species on the island that does something similar. Three minutes? Okay, let's zip through these. Last one. Who made this track? One, two, three. Decent sized track. All right, so um, let's just discuss these real quick. You've got your list. As we go through, um, who made this track? Uh, this was an easy question. So on your sheet there, we're gonna give you a score at the end of this, just for fun. This was a one point question. This is beaver sign. So if you said beaver, give yourself a one. Um, if you didn't, give yourself a negative three there. Okay? So beaver. Um, this one is river otter tracks. All right? And I'd love to talk about all these features and everything. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time. Um, but we've got some webbing. We've got five toes on each of those feet. Uh, so we have... Um, if you got it correct, that's a difficult question. You get three points. If you didn't call it river otter, you get negative one. Um, this was otter scat. That was also uh, considered a difficult question. So you get uh, three for it and negative one if not. That's uh, the pileated woodpecker sign. Okay, big hole in the side of the tree. You get plus one. It's an easy question, at least where I am. Um, plus one if you get it correct, negative three incorrect. Okay, this is frog tracks. All right, so this is the rear foot. This is the front foot. This is the other front foot. This is the other rear foot. All four feet are on the ground. Difficult question, if you got it correct, you get a plus three, negative one, incorrect. Uh, this is muskrat tracks, okay? 
hind foot, front foot, five toes on the rear, four toes on the front. It's a small little track, about an inch long. This is about two, two by two. So it's a moderate question, difficulty. Uh, if you got it correct, that's two. Incorrect, the minus two. Yes, you see the tail going by right there too, right? Yep. Uh, who made this track? That is a raccoon. All right. So, and this is uh, considered an easy question. It's a very clear, almost like a handprint of a person. It's one point if you got it correct, three point, ne negative three incorrect. And we had the foot. Which foot was it? Well, this was a hind uh, foot, right hind foot. And um, this is a front foot in comparison, the difference in size. And this is like the thumb, of, or you know, the inner toe set back, so it's lower than the outer toe over here, all right? So that was also a difficult question. You get the plus three for it, negative one, if you got it incorrect. This one, like I said, not on the island. This is black bear bite mark on the side of a tree, okay? Two and two, two for correct, minus two incorrect. This is a side trot pattern, or just a trot would be fine. There's your scoring in the bottom corner. And I'm sorry I can't go through all the details on what these right now. This one is a porcupine, all right, with the scat pouring out of the bottom of the tree. You might have seen that in field guide pictures. It's always quite impressive to see. Oh, the scoring, yes. Uh, that was an easy question for where I am. <laughs> okay, it has shock value when you see it. <laughs> so correct, so uh, for that one, let's, let's, you could change the scoring on that one, okay? Because we'll change it to difficult because they're not even on the island. Make it a three and switch it around, okay? So it's three if you got it correct, one off, all right? <laughs> see, I'm pretty flexible in this. Uh, who made these track here? Well, that is a deer track, okay? It's a running deer track. It was a moderate question because it's not the typical heart-shaped one you see. Those are dew claws back there. So those are the two toes that are modified and brought back. Whoops. And that's a rear foot dew claws. So, oh, I did that now. How do I get back? Okay. So um, that's a rear foot, and that has to do with the spacing and the way these claw dew claws look on the foot. That was a difficult question. That's the scoring there. The mushroom, uh, red squirrel, or uh, any type of squirrel would be fine. And the scoring for that one. And uh, this one I said is not gonna be on the island, uh, but it's similar to the domestic cat behavior. Okay, so this is, if you said domestic cat or any type of cat, that would be fine. This is Bobcat Scat with the scrape. And the last one is the turkey track. All right, so three toes pointing forward and the one toe pointing backwards there. That is a two point question. All right, so, you know, we'll go through these a little bit of scoring here. Um, <laughs> Don't beat yourself up over it. This is all on slides here. Um, it makes it a little bit more challenging. So this is how you do the scoring if you're curious on, on doing this. Um, you add up all the points you got as correct answers, and then you add up all the points you got as incorrect answers. So add up all your negatives as one total, all your positives of one total. You add those together, together and then you're gonna divide it that uh, the ones you got correct ver against that number, the combined number of the total points, okay? So that's the scoring. Points correct, plus the points incorrect. Now that's not a negative number, that's gonna be a positive number, okay? Do you, does that all make sense? All right, um, so that's, that's all I have time for. Uh, with maybe have a few questions here or not? All right. Okay, uh, um, a number of years ago, yep. um, I was on a literal trip the weekend of two nor'easters. 
And we had gone to some place, and as I said, it was raining out. It was a sandy area. And the thing was like the size of a dinner plate, and it basically had a tail. We didn't know what it was. I went to the library when I got home. Where do you, if you find an interesting track, where do you go to get information on it? Uh, well, the, the resources I just mentioned, the, the track books, the mammal tracks and sign, there's bird tracks and sign. There's a ton of new field guides that are new, available. New, that could be the question. They're new. Because they're when I they're newer there. field guides. They're with, well, within the past 10 years, they've been written. So there's a whole new troop of field guides. But there, there's, um, if you were to just go on Amazon and type in tracking field guides, you'll see the most current <laughs> lists come up. Um, you could always email someone like myself photographs. You know, just find someone, type in track and sign, or one of your local people on the island here who've done this evaluation. Mike would be a good bet here. It was a number of years ago, and yeah. I mean, Don Reapy, I don't know if he's here today, but he came out with Alien. Um, but I mean, there was no, I, okay, so now I have some resources. Hey, what, what, what was Don Reapy's answer? It was an alien? Yes. Yeah. You, you gotta watch out for Reapy. Um, I mean, he's been known to bring uh, rubber snakes and throw rocks at it and do all sorts of crazy things. I think, um, I think actually, I should point out though that um, I, I do get a lot of emails with photographs, particularly since we've been uh, focusing recently on river otter sightings and the coyote uh, workshop. Um, and but there's a the, the very important thing is that if you take photographs. Oh, sorry. Um, I was clapping. <laughs> I was clapping built into the slide. <laughs> you take photographs, make sure you get a close-up of the individual print with a scale, something that gives relative size. And then also take a picture of the general track pattern. Uh, those are two things that are really key with the scale in each photo. Yeah, and there's my email if you got any, any further questions. Or if you want to send me a photo, that's fine too. Um, and there's one other site on Facebook, I think, Animals Don't Cover Their Tracks. I think that's like a monitored site that people check in on frequently. You can often post a picture up there, and there's a whole network of people talking about identifying things. And iNaturalist, if anybody's familiar with that, I know that Jonah Evans, the one guy from Texas, has set up a site on there that's documenting tracks, and there's often di dialogue about that. That's, a, that's a, something that runs on a iOS or Android, iNaturalist.